What's up guys, we are back with a big day of MLB and NBA action here on Monday, April 22nd. I appreciate everyone who wished me a nice day off. Yesterday was our first day not posting a video since February 2nd. We are rejuvenated and ready to dive in and find us some winners in this very good MLB slate and some interesting spots in the NBA playoffs. Take a second and hit that like button to show some support to the channel and all the work we've been putting in here every single day. If you're new, take a second and subscribe. It's 100% free and can keep you from missing out on these picks. These videos are sponsored by StompTheSpread.com. Click the link in the description and go over there and join our free email list and check out our top confidence plays on all the major sports. Comment below with all the bets you're looking at today and we will give our best advice on all of them. We respond to absolutely every single comment so let us know anything you want to say about my picks, these videos, or anything you see here. As always, the vinyl picks will be in the pinned comment down below. Now let's get into our first game of the day. We've got the Oakland A's heading to New York to take on the Yankees. The A's come into this game, got to be a little bit disappointed. They just got swept in a three-game series against the Cleveland Guardians. They were able to keep game two of that series close, but the other ones they lost by at least two runs or more. They lost by eight runs in the first game of the series, but by four runs in the last game of the series, so not exactly what they had in mind. They're only eight and 14 on the season overall. Things are looking pretty bleak in Oakland in this one. They're handing the ball in this day game to J.P. Spears. He comes into this one with a one and one record on the season and a 4.35 ERA. He's going to be making his fifth start of the season, and things have actually looked really good for him in his last two outings. Last time out against the St. Louis Cardinals, he gave up only two hits and a single run over five innings of work, so not bad at all. He did only have two strikeouts and three walks in that game, so not exactly elite there. But in his start before that, he dominated the Texas Rangers. Back on the 11th, he gave up only a single hit over six and a third innings. He had five strikeouts in that one and only three walks. So the guy can walk some batters. There's no way around that. But he's not giving up a lot of hits recently. He seems to have recovered from a very slow start where he got shelled by the Cleveland Guardians and the Detroit Tigers. But in general now, he's throwing the ball pretty well. He's not going super, super deep into games, but he seems to be back on a very solid track. And I think we can feel decent about how he's pitching right now. The A's in general, their offense not looking too hot. They're almost dead last in the majors in most of the big offensive statistical categories that we look at. They've scored only 63 runs this season, which has them 29th in the league. Their team batting average is just over 200, which is 28th in the league. Just not a lot of positives to find for this team. I mean, their leading batting average guy is J.J. Bedley. He's only batting 241. Like, we can't get behind a team that just can't hit the ball right now. We did see Max Schumann a couple days ago hit his first ever MLB home run, so I guess that's pretty exciting, but really no major positive news to report for this team. They only scored two runs in their last game, three in the game before that, and two in the game before that. They're just not a team that can put any runs up on the board, and they're going to need to score some runs here going up against the New York Yankees, who come into this game. They're 15-7 and seven on on the season so far. They just won two out of three against the Tampa Bay Rays, so they had to feel pretty good about that. They're going to be handing the ball on this one to Carlos Rondon. He comes into this game. He's gotten off to a pretty solid, but not exactly elite start to his season. He's 1-1 one and one with a 3.66 ERA, so good, but not exactly like throw the guy a parade good. The last time out against the Toronto Blue Jays, he looked good, but not amazing. He gave up three earned runs over four innings of work, so I would say that tends to lean more towards the just not that great in general type of outing. Um, before before that, he did go six innings against the Marlins had six strikeouts in that outing, but he gave up five hits in that one. He's given up at least five hits in every outing this season, and that six innings against the Marlins is the deepest that he's gone into a game, so we're not exactly thrilled with this guy. I mean, he's done decent. The Yankees are three and one in his starts this season, but he just went up against the Blue Jays and not looking so hot. So, I mean, obviously going up against the Oakland A's is a little bit different of a situation, but in general, I don't think we can feel like fantastic about him out there on the mound. The Yankees' bats are starting to warm up. They looked pretty decent against the Rays. I mean, they did have a game where they got shut out, so I guess we can't freak out too much about how good they're looking, but we have seen Juan Soto swinging the bat really well recently. Juan Carlos Stanton, he's hitting some home runs here to start the season. The real problem for the Yankees has been the struggles Aaron Judge has had. He's kind of getting booed by the fans now, so that's not exactly a great look. I mean, he got struck out four times in one game, so I think we can definitely say that he's having a hard time seeing the ball, and maybe his swing is a little bit messed up. It's hard to tell, obviously, from the outside looking in, but I do expect him to come around at some point this season. It's difficult to know. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly when that'll be, but in general, the Yankees' offenses look pretty good. Their team on base percentage is 333, which is good for fifth in the majors, so we do expect their run score numbers to come up a little bit. We definitely expect that team batting average of only 239. We think that'll come up a little bit, and that team slugging percentage is definitely going to rise from being close to being in the bottom 
bottom third of the league. So just in general, we do expect the Yankees to start scoring a little bit more, but it's not looking that bleak right now, just in general. Looking at the numbers for this game, we see that the Yankees are massive favorites. They're minus 238 in this one. The Oakland A's are plus 210. That's a big number, and I mean, it's baseball, guys. Oakland's going to win some games, so... I think you could look at Oakland plus 210 in this one, but I think we're going to lean more towards looking to the over-under in this game. I don't super trust either pitcher, though, so that's kind of a tough look. I don't trust either offense, though, so that makes it really, really hard to find good value here on the over-under for this game. Guys, I think I'm going to lean slightly towards just taking... I don't know. It seems tough to say take the Oakland A's in this spot. It really, really does. Getting that great of a price in a game that I don't feel super confident on either way. If you want to bet this one, you can take a flyer on either team if you want. Maybe take a flyer on the over in this game. It is a day game, but I don't think we expect amazing weather for the Yankees. So honestly, this game overall, I just threw it in because it's the first game on the slate. So it might end up just being a pass for me. I don't see a ton of value on this one on any of the numbers. Moving on from a very mediocre looking first game of the slate, the only day game we've got on there. Now we're looking at a regularly scheduled evening game. We've got the Milwaukee Brewers going on the road to take on the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Brewers come into this game fresh off of a three game sweep of the St. Louis Cardinals. So it's gotta feel great for them to sweep a NL Central opponent. They've won four games in a row now. They're 14 and 16 on the season. Have to feel great. And they're heading into the ball in this one to Joe Ross. He comes into this game, he's one and one with a 4.91 ERA. So not exactly dazzling out there. And his last time out, he got absolutely shelled by the San Diego Padres. He gave up nine hits, seven runs over only four and two-thirds innings of work. He's really only had one good start this season, and it was a very short one against the Minnesota Twins. He didn't give up any runs, but he did walk five hitters in that game, so I don't think we feel really great about handing the ball to Joe Ross in this one, if for the Brewers. They, however, will be feeling very, very good about their, about their offense, which is absolutely raking right now. Their team batting average is second in the majors. Team on base percentage is also second. They scored 114 runs, which easily has them in the top 10 in the majors. Just in general, this team is hitting the cover off the ball. It doesn't seem like they're missing missing Christian Yelich here too much. He's going to be missing a little bit of time, but I don't think he'll be out too long. And just in general, when you've got William Contreras batting 354 and he's already got 20 RBIs this season, I think you can feel pretty good about how things are looking. They're going to be going up against the Pittsburgh Pirates, so another NL Central opponent in this one. The Pirates have hit an absolute brick wall in this one, guys. They've lost their last six games in a row. Has to feel pretty, pretty bad after getting off to such a bad good start. They're 11 and 11 on the season right now, and they're going to be handing the ball in this one to Jared Jones, hoping that he can stem the tide. He's coming off of a very, very good start against the New York Mets, where he gave up only a single hit over five innings of work and had seven strikeouts. But taking on the Milwaukee Brewers is going to be a little bit different than the Mets, who were in quite the hitting slump and he took on them. Just in general, though, this season, he's looked very, very good. He's sporting an ERA of only 3.13, and he's only 1-2 and two on the season. Hasn't gotten a ton of run support, especially not lately. We've seen the Pirates lose three of the four games that he started, so that can't feel pretty good. Looking at this game, we see the Brewers are plus 115, so that's a little bit intriguing if we had any faith in their starter, but guys, I have very little faith here in Joe Ross. I kind of think both of these teams are due to put up some offense. The Brewers are going to hit the ball against pretty much anybody, it feels like, and the Pirates are in a pretty good spot to score some runs against one of the Brewers' worst pitchers. So if you wanted to look at the over-under in this game, you can still find some eights out there. We see some trends. We've got Milwaukee. They're 13 and 7 to the over this season. Pittsburgh is 12 and 10 to the over this season. So we're definitely going to be on over eight in this game. I don't know if it'll make it into our pinned comment picks, but we definitely like it a good amount. Next up, guys, we're looking at the Philadelphia Phillies going on the road to take on the Cincinnati Reds. Phillies come into this game playing their best ball here, the early goings. They've won their last six in a row. They the Chicago White Sox right after sweeping the Colorado Rockies, so they have to be feeling great about that. They're 14-8 and eight on the season now. The bats are starting to come alive, and things are just looking up right now. They're handing the ball in this one to Ranger Suarez. He comes into this game. He's off to one of the best starts in the majors. He's 3-0 and on the season. He's sporting a 1.73 ERA. The guy is just absolutely dealing right now. He's coming into this one fresh off of a complete game. He went nine innings, gave up seven hits, zero runs against the Colorado Rockies. So he was part of that sweep and he just is dealing right now. There's no way around it. The guy is looking fantastic coming into this game. He's off to an amazing start. This short left-hander just killing it here out of the gate. The Phillies in general, they're hitting the ball quite a bit better lately. They've scored seven, nine, and eight runs over their three-game series against the White Sox. So that has to feel pretty good, putting up a ton of runs right now. Trey Turner is hitting the ball really well. Kyle Schwarber's already got six home runs. We see Alec Bohm Leaving, leading the team in RBIs. So just in general, this team is looking fantastic. They've scored 96 runs this season, but that only has them in very the middle of the pack in the majors. 
but that number is going to continue to go up as they continue to just look so good at the plate. We saw Zach Wheeler just have a no-hitter bid come to an end in the eighth inning. This team is just looking good up and down, and they're going to need to continue looking good here going up against the Cincinnati Reds, who are coming fresh off of a sweep of the Los Angeles Angels. They come into this game, they have only won three in a row. They are only 12-9 and nine on the season, so they haven't been looking this good all year long, but they have to feel pretty good right now. We did see their bullpen get kind of run through after we saw Frankie Montas leave the game in the first inning, but the bullpen looked fantastic, so that's at least nice, but we could definitely see some tired arms and some lack of availability from guys out there coming into this game. They're going to be handing the ball to Hunter Green, hoping he can go deep into the game, but that has not really been his MO. He has made two starts this year where he lasted six innings, but both of them ended in losses for the Reds. Every game he started this season has actually led to a loss for the Reds. His last time out against the Seattle Mariners, he gave up four hits and four innings, only a single earned run, and he had eight strikeouts, so he wasn't looking too bad out there in general, but he does have an ERA this season of 4.35, and he's 0-1, so not a ton of positives to report for him here. And in general, looking at the Reds' offense, though, they can feel pretty good about that. We've seen Spencer Steer get off to a good start. And this team in general, they're 10th in the majors in terms of runs scored. Their team slugging percentage also has them 10th, but their team batting average is a little bit suspect. It's only 225, which has them 24th in the majors. And their team on base percentage isn't that great, so those numbers would seem to indicate they're getting a little bit lucky with the run scoring that they're doing. Looking at this game, looking at the prices overall, we see the Phillies are only minus 120, which seems pretty insane out there, unless we're afraid that Suarez is going to have a bad outing after pitching a complete game, but I'm not really going to get that deep into the weeds with this, guys. I think this is just a great spot to take the Philadelphia Phillies. They're very much on the better side here of the pitching matchup. They've been hitting the cover off the ball. They're a red-hot team right now. I know they're playing at Cincinnati, but I don't think that's too much of a uh, downside for them, as their hitters can just easily get the ball out of that ballpark. So give me the Philadelphia Phillies minus 120. I think that's a reasonable price, and I think it'd be pretty reasonable if this ends up as one of our pinned comment picks. Moving right along, guys, we've got the Detroit Tigers going on the road to take on the Tampa Bay Rays. The Tigers come into this game. They're 12-10 and 10 on the season. They just won their series against the Minnesota Twins, two games to one, so they have to feel pretty good about that. I mean, not like a sweep or anything, but you want to win those series, and they did just that. They're going to be handing the ball on this one to Tariq Skubal. He comes into this game. He's looked fantastic here in the early goings. He's 2-0 and with a 2.28 ERA. His last time out against the Texas Rangers was probably his worst start of the season. He only gave up two earned runs. He gave up five hits on six and a third innings. He had one walk and six strikeouts in that outing, so we'll give him a little bit of a pass for that one. In general, the season has been very, very good. That game against the Texans was the first of his starts that we actually saw the Tigers not win the game this season, so that has to feel a little bit bad for him, but I mean, you're going to have some hiccups over a long season, and in general, he's had a very, very good start. The Tigers' hitters in general, though, have not had good starts. This has been one of the worst offensive teams in the majors, and that makes it very, very crazy that they've managed to get out here to this 12-10 and 10 start on the season. Just in general, we've seen Kerry Carpenter get off to a good start, but other than that, that's kind of where the positive ends positives end. In general, this team, they've got 85 runs scored this season, which puts them 22nd in the majors. They're 26th in the majors in terms of team slugging percentage and team batting average, so not really looking like a great squad here at the plate. They're going to need to score some runs going up against the Tampa Bay Rays, who come into this game. They are 12-11 and 11 on the season. They just lost their series to the New York Yankees. They lost that series one game to two, so not exactly a disaster, but in general, this has not been the start the Rays wanted. They're currently in the last spot in the AL East. I know we've got a long way to go, guys, and we probably shouldn't even be looking at those standings, but I guarantee that these players are keeping at least something of an eye on those, as you don't want to end up in some sort of big hole, and they're already three and a half games back. The Rays are going to be handing the ball to Zach Littell in this one. He's had a very good start to his season. He's 1-0 and with a 2.14 ERA. He comes into this game fresh off of a kind of interesting start against the Angels, where he went five and two-thirds innings. He gave up three earned runs, but had seven strikeouts in that outing. Probably his worst outing of the season, which is kind of weird to say he struck out seven, but it was his worst outing. He just gave up a bunch of runs, and that has not been his MO. He also gave up a lot of hits, like the most hits and the most runs he gave up. That's probably your worst start of the season. He has looked good at other times against the Angels, against the Colorado Rockies, and his first start of the year was very, very solid against the Toronto Blue Jays. So, in general, he probably doesn't feel terrible about this matchup going up against the Tigers team that hasn't been hitting the ball that great. The Rays, in general, they've been hitting the ball kind of mediocre as well. They're 19th in the majors in terms of runs scored, 
14th in terms of team batting average. So they've had a couple guys get off to decent starts, don't get me wrong, but they cannot feel very good about where their offense is at right now. Looking at the price for these teams, we see the Rays are only minus 105, the Tigers are minus 108. So pretty much a coin flip here, but guys, I think we're going to be looking at the over-under in this game. I'm expecting very solid starts from both starting pitchers, and we don't really have any bad news on either bullpen right now. You can find some 7.5s out there, and as long as you can find that 7.5, I really like under seven and a half in this game. I don't think we're going to see a lot of offense. Neither offense is looking good. Both starting pitchers are looking good. Go ahead and give me that under. Moving right along here, guys. We're looking at the Miami Marlins going on the road to take on the Atlanta Braves. Miami just earned a series split with the Chicago Cubs, so pretty impressive from them there. Well done. We're not going to see a lot of positives from this team, but we saw some home runs from them, and just in general, they looked pretty good against the Cubs. They won 6-3 to three in their last game of that series. They're going to be handing the ball in this one to Ryan Weathers. He's gotten off to a pretty good start this season. Not something you can say for a ton of Marlins pitchers, but he definitely has. He's 2-1 with a 2.70 ERA, so Got to feel pretty good about that. The Marlins are actually 2-2 two and two in games that he started this season, so that is not the norm for them. His last time out, he gave up only two runs in six innings against the San Francisco Giants, and he had 10 strikeouts in that outing as well. He did give up a home run, so not a perfect outing by any stretch of the imagination, but very, very good, and it's nice to see from this young guy. You want this uh, franchise in general to have some hope, and maybe he gives them a little bit of reason for hope here. He's looked very, very good this season, which is not something you can exactly say for the Miami Marlins offense. They're 28th in the majors in terms of slugging percentage, 25th in batting average, and their team runs scored. Not looking so hot, guys. There's 85 runs scored. Puts them at 22nd place in the majors. So definitely a number that's trended a little bit in a positive direction here lately, but not something I think they can really sustain here. Not a lot of big names on this uh, roster, and I don't really see them putting up a ton of runs anytime soon. But they're going to need to score some runs here going up against the Atlanta Braves, who come into this game fresh off of their first loss in quite some time. However, they did win that series against the Texas Rangers three games to one, so they can feel pretty good about that. And I don't think they're too scared here handing the ball to Bryce Elder, even though he's going to be making his his first start of the season. In 2023, he looked fantastic. We saw him spend some time in the minors, but he's back up with the big league squad, and I think we can expect some very, very solid pitching from him. This is a young guy. He's a good, good right-handed pitcher, and I think we'll see him get off to a good start here this season. Now that he's getting his chance here in the rotation, the Braves in general, they've been hitting the ball great this season, been one of the best or probably really the best offense in the majors this year. They are second in terms of run score. They've scored 125 runs this season. Their team batting average is first in the majors, batting 283 overall. Team slugging percentage, not quite at 500 like it has been, but it's at 475 on the season. Like, absolutely crazy stuff. They're getting on base at a 353 clip. Like, this team is scoring some runs. They're looking absolutely dominant, so we can feel very good about that one. Looking at the price, the odds makers clearly agree with us. The Atlanta Braves are massive favorites at minus 220. This is actually a pretty tough game to figure out. We see both teams with trends to the over. I am expecting fairly decent pitching from both sides here. I don't think the Braves are just going to absolutely jump on Ryan Weathers. Like He's had a very good season here so far, so that makes this a tough game to pick. You could actually go with the Marlins here as big underdogs. You're getting almost two to one on him. So that could be interesting. If you think Bryce Elder is going to struggle here in his first start of the season, you could definitely take a peek there at the Marlins plus all the, like, that's a lot. That's pretty, pretty solid price there. But just in general, I think we're going to see decent pitching from bull starters. And the over under in this game is at nine and a half. You can definitely find some nine and a halfs out there. So you could maybe take a little, little taste of that. I'm not sure which one we're going to go with guys. There's probably going to be some of you out there that are going to be interested in that Atlanta Braves minus one and a half. And I guess I couldn't argue with you there too much. Miami's only eight and 15 against the run line this season. But in general, I think this will be a game that we'll stay away from. If you force me to bet it, I think we probably take the Marlins as a long shot in this one. But I don't know if this is a game we're really particularly going to be on because I don't know which which way to go with these starting pitchers. And I struggle to uh, feel a large degree of confidence when we're if we're trying to back somebody who's going to be making his first start of the season. So. We're going to pass on this one, and we'll see what happens. Next on the docket, guys, we're looking at the Chicago White Sox going up against the Minnesota Twins. Chicago comes in this game fresh off of getting swept by the Philadelphia Phillies, and things are not getting better for the Chicago White Sox. They're basically turning into a meme on the internet now. There's all kinds of videos out there that botched a rundown play that they had where they, they just 
yeah, man, they're throwing the ball all over the diamond, not looking like a Major League Baseball team exactly to me. So that's a little bit embarrassing, and their 3-18 and record on the season is very embarrassing. They're going to be handing the ball in this one to Jonathan Cannon. He's gotten off to a very good start to his season in one start this year, though. He's only making his second start of the year. He dominated the Kansas City Royals, guys. There's really no other way to put it. I mean, he, did, he gave it one run, so maybe I'll take that back. Maybe not quite dominated, but in five innings of work, three strikeouts, only three hits, that'll work, especially for a young guy who's just kind of getting in there. Looked pretty good. 1.80 ERA has to be fun for him to have, and in general, we're struggling to find a lot of positives here for the Chicago White Sox guys. They have been the worst offensive team in baseball. They're dead, dead last in every major hitting category just not putting up any runs, and there's no reason to really expect that to change here. They're going up against the Minnesota Twins, who are only 7-13 and on the season. They've only won one game out of their last seven, I believe it is. They got one win against the Detroit Tigers in that last series, so things not exactly looking up for the Twins. They have to be hoping that Chris Paddock can handle uh, the starting duties for this one, but Things have looked very, very bleak for him, or at least they did in his last start. He got shelled by the Baltimore Orioles. He gave up nine earned runs and five and a third, guys, which is kind of a departure. He's actually been serviceable this season, but I'm not going to call his two earned runs in four innings against the Brewers or his two earned runs in 4.2 innings against the LA Dodgers exactly lights out pitching. So not a lot of reasons to feel good about Paddock here. And not a lot of reasons to feel good about the Minnesota Twins offense either. They've been very, very low on the term in terms of scoring runs this season. They've scored only 67 runs through all these games, guys. Not a great look. 29th in batting average, 29th in slugging percentage. They're right down there scraping the bottom of the barrel with the White Sox. Seems kind of crazy looking at this game that you see the Twins as big favorites. They're minus 175 in this game. You also see the over-under is at a normal number. It's at 8.5, which shows there's not a ton of faith out here in these two pitchers. But I think that's a little bit misplaced, especially going against bad offenses. Like, Jonathan Cannon, in addition to having an amazing name, has pretty solid stuff. I mean, he's a huge guy. He throws the ball pretty well. Like... I don't have a ton of concerns for him, and we see Paddock in. He's definitely in a bounce back spot, guys. I mean, how much uh, can we faith can we put in that? Maybe not a crazy amount, but I do have a lot of faith in these teams being terrible hitting the ball. We see the White Sox are 12, 8, and 1 to the under this season. We see the Minnesota Twins are 11, 8, and 1 to the under. And we see the over-under at a normal number. It's at 8.5. Guys, we're going to be on this under, I'm pretty sure. I think there's a decent chance this makes it into our pinned comment plays. I don't think we're going to see a lot of offense in this game in general. And while I don't super trust either starting pitcher, I think they both have pretty decent stuff. And I think we can expect both of them to have pretty good outings, especially given the uh, low caliber of hitter they're going to be facing in this game. Next up, we're going to be looking at the Toronto Blue Jays going on the road to take on the Kansas City Royals. Toronto comes in this game fresh off of winning their series against the San Diego Padres, but they did lose game three of that series. They weren't able to finish off that sweep, but at 12 and 10 on the season and definitely trending in a positive direction. They have to feel good about the way things are going right now. They're going to be handing the ball in this one to Yusei Kikuchi. He comes into this game. He's looked very good here in the early goings for sure. He's only 1-1, one one, but his ERA is only 2.08, so that's very, very solid. His last time out, he dominated the Yankees. He only gave a single earned run and four hits through six innings. He also had nine strikeouts in that outing, so got to be feeling pretty good about that. He's looked very, very good here in the early goings. The Blue Jays' offense in general has looked a little bit better here lately. I mean, they're not exactly hitting the cover off the ball. They do have some positives. I mean, we've seen Justin Turner hit the ball well here out of the gate, and some other things are kind of pointing in the right direction. Like, they scored 10 runs in their two wins against the Padres. They scored 13 runs in that series overall, so not terrible. And they have won six of their last eight games in general, so this is definitely a team a little bit on the rise here. Can't feel too bad about that. And speaking of teams on the rise, they're taking on the Kansas the City Royals who really want to be a team on the rise but have gotten slapped back down a little bit here recently. They did lose their last two games of their series against the Baltimore Orioles. Their last one they lost five to nothing so getting shut out not exactly a great look. In general though they can't be too disappointed with how the season has started. Not a lot of uh, huge expectations for this team and at 13 and 9 not a disaster start to the year. They've got to be stoked, though, to be handing the ball here to Brady Singer. He's off to an amazing start. He's 2-0 with a 1.54 ERA, so that's amazing. We've also seen the Royals go 4-0 this season in his starts. His last time out, he dominated the White Sox. Not exactly a huge accomplishment, but in the outing before that one, he dominated the Houston Astros, so that has to feel pretty good. 
A lot of this guy's numbers have come against bad opponents, don't get me wrong, but I don't think we can exactly put the Toronto Blue Jays up there as like a monster hitting team, at least at this point in the season right now. Looking at the Kansas City Royals bats, they've been pretty decent. They're in the top third of the majors in terms of runs scored and team slugging percentage, so hovering right around that top 10 mark cannot feel bad. They've got to be... It feeling pretty great about that to be honest we see salvador perez get off to a good start to the season he's got six home runs already and while they didn't look great there at the end of that series against the orioles they did score seven runs in one of those games that they lost so when you score seven runs you expect to win those games the majority of the time and looking at the numbers for this game we do see it's basically a coin flip we see the royals are actually the slight favorites and playing at home that kind of makes sense to us i think we can get behind that we do see both teams with trends to the under and we do expect both of these pitchers to look very very good so i feel like we're taking a lot of unders in this game guys but when we see the blue jays are 12 and 10 to the under and the royals are a very solid under team they're 13 8 and 1 to the under the over under for this game sitting at eight and a half and we definitely trust kikuchi and singer to have very solid outings this is going to be an underplay for us as well. I think we expect offense to be at a premium in this game. I don't think either team's going to be hitting the cover off the ball. And yeah, I just don't think we're going to see a lot of offense. I think there's a very, very good chance this ends up as being one of our pinned comment plays down below. Moving right along, guys, we have the Arizona Diamondbacks going on the road to take on the St. Louis Cardinals. The Diamondbacks come into this game fresh off of splitting a four-game series with the San Francisco Giants. They've gotten off to a kind of middling start. They're only 11-12 and 12 on the season overall, so they can't be too excited about that. In this game, they're going to be handing the ball here to Brandon Fought. He's gotten off to kind of a decent start, I guess. He looked good his last time out. He did go deep in the game. He went seven innings, but he did give up three runs. Two of them were earned. He gave up a home run, but he also had six strikeouts, so there are positives and negatives to take from that start for sure, so I don't exactly know which way to lean with that. He has gotten roughed up a couple times this season, but he got off to a very good start to the year against the Colorado Rockies, so what can we expect to see from him in this one? going against the Cardinals, a team that roughed him up in six innings the last time he faced them back on the 12th, so it's going to be interesting to see what he can do in this game. Something that's been very interesting to see this season has been the emergence of the Diamondbacks offense. They scored 130 runs so far this season. That is first place in the majors, guys. They've just been hitting the ball extremely well. Have things cooled off a little bit recently here? I guess you could kind of make the case for that. I mean, they scored five runs again in one of these games, but they scored 17 runs 17 runs guys in one of these games against the Giants so they've definitely got the offense to put up crazy outbursts of numbers it's going to be interesting to see what they can do here going up against the St. Louis Cardinals who are going to be hoping they can bounce back from a very disappointing showing against the Milwaukee Brewers the Cardinals have now lost four straight they lost one game at the end of that series of the Oakland A's and then got swept by the Brewers they gave up 12 runs in one of those games they scored a grand total of six runs in the entire series. They got shut out in the last game of the series. The Cardinals bats are just not awake this season here in the early goings. And if they can't figure that out pretty quick, things are going to get very, very bleak. They're hitting the ball in this one to Lance Lynn, who's gotten off to a good start to his season for sure. His last time out, he looked dominant against the Oakland A's. He gave up only a single earned run over seven innings of work. He only gave he only had one strikeout. He's not a strikeout pitcher, guys. He's definitely going to pitch to contact, but that can work out just fine for him. And in general, it seems to have been a great way to pitch so far this season he did get roughed up by the miami marlins a really weird deal you see all these pitchers getting randomly touched up by the marlins which doesn't make any sense but in general the st louis bats they have been the main problem we haven't seen goldsmiths or any of the big name guys on the cardinals that you expect to put up some solid offensive numbers the veterans are just not getting off to a good start they're in the bottom third of the league for sure in every major offensive category and it's I think that's something that's going to change eventually, guys, but it's very, very tough to know when that might happen. Looking at the numbers for this game, we see it's basically a coin flip. The Diamondbacks, minus 105. The Cardinals, minus 108. The over-under is at 8.5, so that's a pretty normal number. We do see St. Louis is a solid under team. We see Arizona is about a 50-50 over-under team, so not a lot of trends that we can take from that. In general, in this game, what do we expect to see, really, from Brandon Fott? It's tough to imagine him having a great outing against a Cardinals team that's already roughed him up once this season and the way Lance Lynn is pitching and the fact that the Cardinals are desperate for a win right now we're definitely going to be leaning towards St. Louis minus 108 not super confident that this will make it into one of our core plays but it definitely could we do have fought already having trouble with the Cardinals once this year so that's a pretty solid trend that we could go with but we'll see make sure to check down below before you bet this game but if you're determined to just snap at it without checking that comment regardless we're going to be on the Cardinals minus 108. Moving right along, guys, we're looking at the San Diego Padres going on the road to take on the Colorado Rockies. The Padres snapped their three-game losing streak 
getting one win in their three game series against the Toronto Blue Jays. Not exactly what they were hoping for. Obviously the Padres, we see they're only 12 and 12 on the season in general. They're hoping they can get things back on the track that they want them to be on, handing the ball in this one to Dylan Cease. He comes into this game. He's looked solid this season. He's two and one with a 1.99 ERA. So no problems there with the way this guy's gotten off to a start in his season. His last time out, he dominated the Milwaukee Brewers. He gave up only a single run over six innings of work. He had seven strikeouts. He does have the tendency to walk some batters. He's walked at least two in each game this season, and he walked five against the Brewers in that one. So it's a little bit of a concern. You don't want to be just gifting guys their way onto base for free. Kind of want to make them earn it. But in general, he's gotten off to a very good start to the season. The Padres' bats have also gotten off to a very good start. They're in top 10 in basically every meaningful offensive category. They did get some pretty bad news four days ago when we saw Yu Darvish go on that injury list. But we don't know how long he'll be on there. It was a neck tightness issue. So hopefully he'll be back soon. But we'll just have to wait and see on that one. They're seventh in the majors in terms of runs scored. We've seen Jackson Merrill get off to a good start. Fernando Tatis is hitting some home runs. He's batting 261 in the year with six home runs and 15 RBIs. Nothing wrong with those kind of numbers. San Diego is definitely going to want to be taking advantage of the Colorado Rockies, who have not gotten off to a good start to this season. They're 5-17 and 17 on the year overall. They got only a single win in their series against the Seattle Mariners, which is actually an improvement because they got swept in the series before that by the Phillies. So things not looking so hot for the Rockies. They're going to be handing the ball in this one to Austin Gomber, who's gotten off to not a disaster start necessarily, but nothing dominant. In his last time out against the Phillies, he gave up three earned runs and six hits over five and a third. In the start before that, he did look good against the Diamondbacks, who are a good offensive team for sure, but he hasn't really been dominating opponents but he's been looking decent despite facing some tough ones. So it'll be interesting to see how he fares against the San Diego Padres. And it'll also be interesting to see what kind of run support he can get from a Rockies team that historically is supposed to be one that will hit the ball, but that hasn't really been the case in this one. They're 25th in terms of runs scored this season, 20th in team slugging percentage. Their team batting average is right at average on the season for the entire league. They're batting 241 overall. So not a lot of crazy positive things to report on that one. What are we going to see from this offense going up against a pretty solid pitcher? I don't know if we're going to see too much, guys. Looking at the over-under in this game, we see that it's at a crazy 10.5 runs. I mean, this game is happening at Coors Field, so all kinds of craziness can happen. But I don't think we're going to be really messing with the over-under in this game, guys. I think we're just going to be taking the easy pick here and going with the San Diego Padres minus 180. I think they'll win this game pretty convincingly. I don't think Gomber's got what it takes to shut them down. I do think we'll see a good outing from Cease, so... Give me the San Diego Padres minus 180 in this game. Heading over to the NBA side, guys, we're going to cover a couple of these playoff games we've got here on Monday night. We're looking at the Philadelphia 76ers taking on the New York Knicks here in game two of their Eastern Conference first round series. We saw the 76ers take the loss in game one. As we predicted, we had the Knicks minus three in that one. Felt pretty good to get the win there. The Knicks won 111 to 104 behind a Great night from Jalen Brunson, despite the fact that he shot only 8 of 26 from the field. He scored 22 points. We all saw McBride play really, really well off the bench. He scored 21 points. The Knicks shot the ball well from the field. They did a good job getting to the free throw line against a Philadelphia team that loves to be the ones to get to the free throw line. And most importantly in this game, something we're going to be looking at in this series overall for sure, we saw the Knicks dominate the boards. They had 55 rebounds to the 76ers, only 33 that is a huge, huge stat. Tells you a lot about how this team is going to do. A lot about how which team is the most locked in, the one that can dominate and play with the higher degree of energy and effort. We saw Ananobi. He played great on defense. He produced offense when he needed to, but just in general, we're very, very happy with how the Knicks looked in this game. For the 76ers, could not feel too good about how Embiid looked. He went 8 for 22 from the field. He did get to the free throw line 12 times. His foul grifting is a vital part of his game, but he didn't get to the line as much as he would have wanted to. And while we saw Maxi get off for 33 points, none of those things were enough. They had to play extremely heavy minutes. Both of them did. We saw Embiid not looking like himself out there, coming down a little bit awkwardly. It's clear that he's not fully recovered in terms of just like his windage and just how he's moving up and down the court. And we saw him limping. There's a little bit of blood on his like knee, which I'm not sure what that could be from. I'm sure that's not a major concern. That could only be a scrape. Like I couldn't imagine that being anything worse than a scrape, but 
overall, it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot out there for the 76ers except for Embiid and Maxi. Their bench didn't look amazing. We didn't see some transcendent shooting game from Batum again, shocker of the season. Like, are we really going to think Cameron Payne's going to come off the bench and do anything meaningful? No. Buddy Heald was basically a no-show in his 11 minutes off the bench. Like, there was no way they could really keep him out there. He just was not looking good. He can't defend anybody anyway. We saw Kyle Lowry have an amazing game. He scored 18 points, but he's about a thousand years old. So how many solid performances do we think he has left in the tank here in the playoffs? I don't know, guys. Things are looking pretty rough here for the 76ers in the beginning of this series. Looking at the numbers overall, they haven't changed that much from game one. We do see the Knicks as a slightly larger favorite. They're minus four and a half in this game. Guys, that is not going to scare us away. We're definitely going to be on the New York Knicks minus four and a half in this one. You can put that in the pinned comment. You can take that one to the bank because we're going to definitely be on that one in a big way. I think the Knicks will take care of business here at home once again. The only way the 76ers are going to be winning games in this series is if Embiid somehow shoots like 20 free throws in a game. Is that impossible? No, it certainly is not, but I don't think we'll see it here in game two. If that's going to happen, it's going to happen in Philly. So go ahead and give me the Knicks minus four and a half in this one. I think we see a very similar game to last time, except for with better and more efficient scoring from the Knicks. So give me New York. They take care of business in game two at home. Moving right along here, guys, we've got the Los Angeles Lakers taking the Denver Nuggets in Game 2 of their Western Conference playoff series here in Round 1. In Game 1 of this series, we saw the Nuggets come away with a relatively comfortable 11-point win. They won 114-103, to 103. and despite seeing the Lakers jump out to a lead in the first quarter, it never really felt like this one was super in doubt for them. They came out and dominated the third quarter. They outscored the Lakers 32-18 to 18 coming out of halftime, so not exactly a huge shocker there. We saw Jokic have a monster game. He scored 32 points, posted a plus 14, plus minus rating. Just in general, the guy looked like a beast. He did only 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 have seven assists in the game, so he wasn't able to put up a triple-double, but he had 12 boards. He just looks unstoppable, guys. The way he runs the game, the way he plays at his own, own pace, Anthony Davis can't seem to do anything with him. None of the Lakers defenders can seem to do anything with him. We didn't see the Nuggets bench look like amazing necessarily in that game. I mean, Watson did look good. He scored eight points and they were efficient. He knocked down a couple of threes. Like the guy is a great energy guy coming off the bench. And I think he's got a very bright future in the league. We did see Christian Brown. He struggled a little bit. I mean, he had five rebounds, so that's something, but only one of five from the field in general. I think he can play a little bit better, especially here at home, but the real story in this one was Jokic and Murray, nobody in the Lakers can stop them. We saw Michael Porter Jr. play well, so we're not too scared about him being shook up by all that weird stuff going on with his family. So right now, the Nuggets are looking very, very good. They looked very good in that game, and in general, they won the Battle of the Boards. So that's another important thing to look at. They had nine more rebounds than the Lakers, which shows that Jokic, just nobody's really able to mess with him in there. Nobody on the Lakers can hold that guy down as evidenced in this game. We did see Anthony Davis. He did score 32 points. He had 14 rebounds, but guys, he was gassed by the end of that game. Things were not looking good for him. It doesn't seem like he has what it takes to stand up against guys like Jokic, or maybe just specifically Jokic. But in general, we did see LeBron play better than I would have expected him to play here in game one of the series. We usually see him play a lot better further down the stretch in a series. I do expect him to exert himself a little bit more in game two, but it doesn't really feel like there was that much he could do in this one. I mean, he scored 27 points. He went three of five from three point range. Like what more can we really ask from LeBron in his like 47th NBA season or whatever it is? What can we really expect for him to be doing right now? We don't see anything meaningful from the Lakers bench. I mean, Torian Prince scored 11 points in 20 minutes. He's the only Lakers player to score points off the bench in this game. I don't think that'll be true for the entire series, but are you really going to be excited for Spencer Dinwiddie or Gabe Vincent coming off the bench? I am not. I don't think the Lakers have enough depth to stay competitive in very many games in this series. I do think they'll likely win one of their games at home, either game two or three, but in this game, we can see the Nuggets are still only minus seven and a half. Give me Denver in this one. It's definitely going to be one of my picks down there in the pinned comment. We'll definitely take them in this one. We're not really interested in the over-under in this game too much, but we're definitely interested in Denver minus 7.5. I think they get a convincing win. Once again, I think we can actually see Jokic and Murray play better than they have in this one. We can see a lot more from their bench, so give me the Nuggets to get the win and cover once again, especially playing on their home court. That's all the games we have for today, guys. Hit that like button for good luck on all your bets and subscribe to the channel if you're new. Let me know in the comments any questions you have on today's slate. Thanks for watching. You can click the link in the description to check out StumpTheSpread.com and we'll see you guys tomorrow for more sports betting action.